Welcome to Women Read Scripture. I'm Mariana Richardson. And I'm Christine Thackeray. And I'm Susan Tanner. And Susan, it's so wonderful having you here with us. Would you like to tell just a little bit about yourself? Well, I'd say for the purpose of this meeting, I am not necessarily a scholar of scriptures, but I'm a lover of scriptures. And so I am here just out of my love for scriptures and my testimony of them. Aren't we blessed to have the word of God? And Susan and I do have a little bit of a, a relationship because of Brazil. That's right. We just um, both loved that mission, and it was just so wonderful to serve one just before the other. It was it was great. And São Paulo Sul, o melhor missão do mundo, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. We loved it there. Um, today we're going to be talking about Acts, the end of Acts. And the last couple of weeks, we've been discussing Acts, and wow, what stories. I mean, I can't imagine. We've got to make it into a multi-movie, you know, uh, <laughs> just there's everything from sorcery to magicians to people running naked in the streets. And, you know, today, all of these stories continue where we have political intrigue and we have secret combinations and snake bites, shipwrecks. You name it. We're talking Paul really knew how to pack it in, the adventure. <laughs> it's, it is kind of fun to see all these fabulous things. But there's also some difficulty with some of the history, especially we have Felix and Festus and Agrippa and all these people that we're really not quite sure who they are or politically, how do they fit in to things. And especially, we already knew Pontius Pilate, but where do all these people fit in? Christine, I know you love that part of the history, and so I would I love for you to explain it to well, us. Well, I do want to give a background to that, in that for me, if I understand the story behind what's happening, then I don't have points that seem, you know, like you'll read it and you'll go, that just does not make sense, because right. I don't understand how it fits. So I thought that this morning I would challenge you both, and I'm going to give you a little quiz on the history of Paul oh, and see how you do. Oh, and no. in all fairness, a lot of these questions I didn't know the answer to until very recently. So if you don't know, <laughs> that's okay. But I think they'll be surprising. So the first one is we know that Paul was originally a Pharisee and that he was searching out people that were the early Christians and having them stoned or killed. And as he was on the road to Damascus to do this, he had his great life-changing vision. So... What year, how many years after Christ's death and resurrection did the road to Damascus happen? Do you know? I would be guessing, and and you can go above and below me because then you'll probably get it right. <laughs> I'm going to say like, uh, you know, so I'm thinking, you know, it was 33 AD when the Savior was, I, I'm thinking around 10 years later, like 42, 43 AD. That's really close to what I was thinking, but I don't it know the answer. 35. Oh, wow. just, so, just two years. Right. Wow. So okay. it was very soon. All right. So after this vision, remember that um, Paul was blind. Right. And he went to who to be healed of his blindness? Well, it was Ananias, the high priest, who healed him, or who blessed him. It no? was not. It was oh. Ananias, but he was not the high priest. He's a righteous Ananias. Oh. So there's an evil Ananias and a righteous, righteous one. Ananias. <laughs> so that is so confusing because you read the one Ananias who we've read about his family at the death of Christ, which was only a few years before. Mm -hmm. So he's the evil Ananias that we know. And but Ananias the, is not nice in these chapters either. Right. right. But the other one, remember, he was just oh, off yeah. in his little, in Damascus, and the Lord said, you know, I need you to come. And he said, here I am, send me. And he went and he healed um, Paul, so it is. I'm so Did he glad have any that. any leadership position in Damascus, or do we not know anything more okay. about him mm -hmm. except that the Lord called him one day and asked him to do this one thing? And he was obviously a believer. Oh yes, yes. obviously a believer. Yes, but right. you know whether he had a calling other but than it, being. I'm a believer. so glad you said that because it, my husband it is, and I were talking about the two, the good Ananias and, and the, the bad evil Ananias. <laughs> so there's two and it is confusing because that name. So I'm so glad you said that. Okay. So after 
his vision, he goes to Jerusalem to tell the brethren who are gathered there about his story. So who listens to him when he comes to Jerusalem? Well, you know? uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Is it well, the no, the very first time, right after his vision. This oh. is not later. Oh, 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 this oh, is oh not sorry. Before the part we're everything, this is right away. Reading. Like the minute he has it, he stays for like a year up with Ananias until right. he kind of recovers. Then he goes down to Jerusalem to tr find the brethren, the early Christians, and tell Peter about his great, you know, conversion. And as he goes there, who listens to him? Do you remember this part? I thought it was... I thought it was Peter. No, nobody will listen to him because they think he's incognito <laughs> he's and a, he's going to kill them. Right, right, so right. So none of the Christians, it says for fear, none of them would listen except one dude from Cyprus, and his name was Barnabas. Okay. And Barnabas is actually Joseph by name, and he was given the name Barnabas by the early Christians, and Barnabas means son of encouragement. Uh -huh. And I oh, think I of that. him as being like Elder Uchtdorf, you know, <laughs> just one of those like feel good people that just really like lifts people. And I always think when and I he saw the, the good of Paul, I know, which is amazing. And so he actually listened to Paul's story and then brings it to the brethren. And then the brethren are like, well, we still don't want him near. So they send Paul back to Tarsus to his hometown. And do you know how long he stays in Tarsus before he does anything in the church? Do you know how long? I know it was a, it was years. I'm not sure how many, but I know it was years. Yeah, it was six or seven yeah. years mm. after the road to Damascus that he's just sitting there, and it's it's a college town, much like Provo. So obviously he's learning and he's studying, and then he's also preaching and telling his story to the local people. But it's very localized. Well, but realize too, he was also a merchant, and so even though when he was going back, his family business. He, I see him as an extremely well-to-do, right. well, you know, wealthy. Which makes sense with Felix waiting for the bribe. Later. Exactly. So and so sense. he had a lot of money and also right. probably a, a, a big, you know, tent-making operation that he right. was also overseeing. So I'm sure he wasn't just sitting around oh, doing yeah. nothing. Well, no, I think that he was actually obtaining the Word of God, that he had to re-look at all the scriptures in terms of Christ and go, oh, that's talking about Christ. The, you know, it would change everything mm -hmm. for him to come as a student of Gamaliel and then suddenly come and believe that we'd have to relearn. But don't you think he was also, I think of people my age who save up to go on a mission. He mm -hmm. may have been. And, and I was wondering, too, during that six, seven years, if he, you know, if he understood that he would be going on a mission and need to save up or some, some money, money that's right? Probably make true. Sure that's probably yeah. true. He had some money. So then... Um, what happens is, of course, Peter has that great vision that allows the Gentiles to join the church. And do you remember who the trigger person was for that vision? Cornelius. Cornelius. Right. And it's so funny because sometimes you think, was Paul bugging him? But no, Paul was, was off in Tarsus, right. was wasn't Cornelius. even part of this. So after they decide that they're going to start preaching, who do they call to start this missionary effort? Barnabas. Barnabas. They right. don't call Paul. Yeah. And it's Barnabas who had listened to Paul that then goes and retrieves Paul. And becomes and so, his missionary right, companion. Right, and becomes his missionary right. companion with Mark. Right. So then they go on their three missions, right. which last about three years each. So it's about 10 years of mission. Well, and Barnabas isn't with them the whole time. Uh, right. The whole time. After we also the have first Luke, one, too, that, right. that comes with with right. Paul. And Timothy. And Timothy who they, as well. Who follows him along. Right. So Silas is the next one, but we've already talked about that, and hopefully you remember. So after he finishes at the very end of his three missions, he knows he has to go back to Jerusalem. Right. And when he knows he has to go back to Jerusalem, um, and, and I think you covered this last time. We did. So what was the big warning that everyone said when he was going back? Well, they knew that people were going to try to kill him. Because uh, it was like he had a price on his head. They, people knew that they wanted him dead, and Paul was very aware of that, and yet he was going anyway Absolutely. because he knew he had to go. And so as he went back, and that's what we're covering this week, is mm -hmm. as he comes back to um, Jerusalem, he comes, and what was the moment that they grabbed him? What was the reason why the fight? The temple. 
He was, in the, he was he at was the, the temple. temple. And, and while at the temple, he was standing next to a Greek. Right. Mm-hmm. And he was not in the wrong place, but they assumed that he may have. And so they pushed her. So it wasn't even, it was based on a lie. Right. It was based on nothing. And so, of course, he gets taken. The chief captain comes up and is like, what is this problem? They bring him up to the steps of the castle. And that's where we're going to talk about. He has that moment to share his testimony with everyone, which is just so beautiful. And then he, um, of course... Um, is sent to Caesarea because he said he's a Roman citizen, citizen to go there. And so, and we'll cover that. But while he's there, we have, and you said, Felix. And then Felix gets replaced by Festus. Right. And because Festus comes as the new Roman governor, then Agrippa comes and his sister Bernice. Mm-hmm. So my question is, um, this Agrippa, is this the same Agrippa that killed James? The last King Agrippa that we just read about. Talked about. The fact that you're bringing, the fact that you're saying it, I'm going to say no. (laughs) Yay! It's his son! So I love the story of the previous Agrippa, who's the one who imprisoned Peter and killed James. That Agrippa, soon after that moment, he is at the Olympics at the Hippodrome, and he has on this silver costume. And people look at him and say, oh, you're so handsome. You look like a god. And he does not correct them. And he doesn't say no. He doesn't say no. Not he didn't a good say thing. he was a god, but he didn't <laughs> say no. And so he gets struck down. And in the scriptures, it says he gets struck down. In Josephus, they talk about this cool owl on a post. And he saw this owl on a post, Mm -hmm. and he knew that his life would be over. And so he is struck down. So it is his son. So this King Agrippa is young. He's only about 20 years old. So he's a little boy. Mm -hmm. So if you think about him as a little boy. Well, he would have a problem with that statement. He's not a little boy. I know. But 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 20, well, in my mind, (laughs) comparatively. He's like my son. (laughs) So, um, but, or a young missionary, you know, like a young, um, just over a young adult. He's a young college student. So he's about that age. And his sister, Bernice, and I want to say this about her, that a lot of people will say they were in an sexual relationship That is just a mean rumor. There is no historical data for that. It was written after because a lot of people did not like them. And if you read their actual data, that's not true. She was a widow. She stayed with him. And then she tried to continue. So we're just going to finish because we're going to cover all this middle part. But I wanted to finish with the end of history because we don't really get that. So after we finish with the trial... And they're almost convinced to be Christians. Then they go have the shipwreck. And what was right. the island he was shipwrecked on? Do you remember? All I know is Publius was the main chief person there, but I don't know what the name of the little... Well, in the scriptures, it's called Melita. Today, we call it Malta. Oh, So okay. if you look at the Robin Williams Popeye a long time ago, that's Malta. It's just mm. a rock. It's... I love it. I love <laughs> so it. So Malta was the um, name of the island, which is oh. right off Italy. And then he goes and he spends two years in Rome. Right. And then he's released for a while. And then he spends another four years in captivity in Rome. And then he is, dies as a martyr. And because he was a Roman citizen, we know he wasn't crucified. He was probably beheaded. Right. And so that was the end of his life. So he died. How many years after Paul died was Jerusalem destroyed by the Romans? Okay, you're asking me to do math. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not good with math. I'll get, well, but I'm, I'm thinking, okay, he he died around, wasn't it like 67, 68, Yeah, 65. 65. Right. And then Jerusalem was destroyed in, wasn't it 70? Very good, no, about eight, 70. 70. I thought right. it was a little bit after, 74. And, yeah. and they're um, right. so, so it's probably like within five right. years of okay. the death of Peter. So what's interesting is after Festus left... The next governor that was put over Israel was um, Florus. His name was Jesius Florus. 
and we don't even care about his name. But when he got there, he saw the temple and the gold in the temple, and it was too much for him. Oh. And so he ransacked the temple. And the great thing, I love Josephus. I shouldn't, but I just love Josephus. Is He's a good historian. Um, Agrippa and Bernice stand before and beg the people not to revolt. Oh. And they just won't listen. Yeah. And so once they revolt, they're gone. So I just wanted to end with the stories of Agrippa. So Agrippa goes back to Rome. His people have been destroyed. And he ends childless, unmarried, meets Josephus, and writes the history of his people. Mm -hmm. And then dies at the age of 70, childless and unmarried. Oh. Never had any seed. Um, Bernice then, she meets uh, Titus, the governor, um, who is in charge of getting the rest of the people. And so the horrible story of Masada, she's the one that's like, please, please, we can take them. They could be slaves. But when they're slaves in Rome, you can then be adopted, become a citizen, and move forward. And she has hope for her people. But, of co course, they don't want to be taken. Mm -hmm. And they commit suicide, and she's right there. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, she drops from history, and we do not know what happens to mm -hmm. her. Oh, but wow. you think of their um, faithfulness in trying to maintain their kingdom and trying to mm -hmm. keep that together, and then, um, and then, and then that is the end of the history we have. Right. And so, as we end Acts, then we start with the, um, the letters epistles, that right. come during um, the epistles, and and then the writings of other prophets. So right. that is the end of our history of the scriptures, which the New Testament is so much like the Old Testament with um, Chronicles and Kings being right at the front. And then we have the history, all the prophets. And then we have all the prophets. Mm -hmm. So it's very similar in its layout. Mm -hmm. Well, I also wanted to make sure people understood when we talk about Pontius Pilate that Felix and Festus, they're all the same. Right. That's right? Same and that, right. So sometimes we think, where's Pontius Pilate? Where did he go? You know, it, it was an assignment and then right. he would go back to Rome, and then another governor would take his right. place. And it only so that's what we're seeing. So many years, about right. ten years. So mm -hmm. they didn't stay for a long, mm -hmm. long time. Mm -hmm. Kind of like being in the church, calling, <laughs> and then you're <laughs> released after so long. Well, and I don't think that they were really happy sometimes these governors to go to Israel. No, you know, it was it, the Wild West. <laughs> right. It was. it was kind of like really Caesar. You want me to go there? <laughs> you know. I think mm -hmm. sometimes that's exactly what they felt like. Yeah. So the truth. Yeah. Well, how wonderful. And, you know, as we talk about this beautiful history, we also talk about the testimonies that are that are that they share, these incredible disciples of Christ. And as you were describing some of the um, difficulties, the prisons, the, the political intrigue that we're going to be talking about, the way that they were thrown into prison and jail— so I, I know, Susan, you were going to talk about how important it is to share our testimony boldly. Yes. Yes, I just admire Paul so much. I mean, he goes into these less than, even more than unfriendly, but vindictive audiences and, 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 uh, and is so bold and so... Um, unworried, I think, about being popular or and, and also even um, not worried about his life particularly. I mean, I think he just has this great trust in Heavenly Father and a great commitment to the testimony that he received and to his mission to share that and to um, to go to all the world to share it. I, I have had a, a lot of fun studying the two times in this body of scriptures that we're studying today, the two times that he shares his testimony, and, um, and I, I like likening it to us. But um, he, besides being bold and being unafraid, um, I, I, I think it's important maybe to just go back and even review some of the elements of the story as he tells it. And we, we see it as a story of receiving and um, living by personal revelation. And that's how Paul lived his life. So he has this, 
he's on the road to Damascus. He's a, a vile sinner, we might say, from our perspective. And, uh, and it's noonday, so bright as can be. But he said they talk about the light being shining so brightly, so up above the light of noonday. And he hears a voice, and the voice is identified as Jesus Christ. And then he says, what shall I do? And I just love that question because yeah. it, it, it's, it, I, I, yeah, he's, uh, he's not just shocked. There's a humility about that question. And um, uh, it reminds me of when Nephi s is told to build a ship and he says, where shall I go to find ore to build tools? He doesn't say, are you kidding? I should <laughs> build a ship. That's how I felt about that question as, as Paul is telling that. And, and then he goes to Damascus and and what happens there is really miraculous. Not the miracle, the physical miracle that he receives his sight, but also kind of the spiritual miracle that he is baptized and forgiven completely of his, these really, these horrible sins that we know about. And, uh, and then kind of the spiritual sight that you will be my witness. And so all of a sudden his spiritual understanding is opening up. And um, it's not till a little bit later, but he recounts this here that he goes back to the temple and they say, you've got to get out of here because of your life. And uh, but also that you will be uh, a missionary to the Gentiles. And so all of these elements where he's really learning is about his life and his mission and his his gifts. And and this experience is so unforgettable and so undeniable that he um, he's committed to to making sure everybody knows and and sharing it no matter what the danger is to him and I did want to say one thing though mm -hmm. when you talk about him being a vile sinner I was reading on a Facebook post someone had said how he was almost like a murderer and I said no because he thought what he was doing was the Lord's will he had studied the scriptures, and he really thought what he was doing. His intent was to follow the Lord. So as soon as the Lord corrected him, then he was ready to do whatever it took. Right. So to he follow would. The Lord. Yeah, he received the correction. That's really right. Admirable. And he received it, and so yeah. there was a humility to receive it. Yes. But I think that we think, and you said in our terms, we think of him in as our vile terms. sinner. Yes. But he was trying to follow the Lord. Yeah. But he just was way off base. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> totally the understand. wrong team. Yes. <laughs> so, but but anyway, so I, I guess as I think about this, I think um, who, who, can, who else do we sort of um, think of as boldly sharing their testimonies in, in, in history? And of course, Alma the Younger is one of them. And, and he did say he was one of the vilest of sinners. But he, he, <laughs> uh, yeah, but he never looked back. Right. And, uh, of course, Joseph Smith had a compelling testimony similar to Paul's, and, and he was persecuted for sharing his testimony, and he even, in his history, refers back to Paul. He says, I feel like, Paul, you know, why do people want to persecute me for just telling what for, is the truth? And, and so, so it's, it's nice to see uh, comparisons along the way. And I've been thinking about... Um, modern day comparisons and actually wondering how we liken it to ourselves. But of course, modern day comparisons are again, prophets and apostles. You know, I was thinking about how the proclamation on the family was given 25 years ago and um, was needed at that time, but not anywhere like it's needed now. And um, we have we have our dear brethren who will stand at the pulpit and defend the truths in that proclamation. And I know that they're not pop among certain people. They're not popular and um, they are belittled for, for doing that kind of thing. And, and I admire that um, commitment to what is right and what is correct. Um, but I, so then I ask myself, so, how have I boldly testified? Or I ask myself, have I had one of those moments or several of those moments that are so um, so grand in converting me that I always remember them and I always refer back to them when I think of my testimony? And that may be a question you want to answer or think about. Have you had a moment or those moments? And then the 
follow-up question is, and have you shared that? Especially have you shared that with your families, with your children? Do they know of our strong testimony moments our, that, that we um, have felt? And, and, and it can be kind of simple, I think. But I, I, I have a friend that uh, I have run with, and she has uh, several children who have, are either inactive or who have left the church. And I really admire how she really um, prays about the right time, but she is pretty bold in, in asking her children if they would like to start reading the Book of Mormon again. And then she testifies how the Book of Mormon can bless their lives. Or can you prepare to come back to the temple? And this is how it will bless your life. And those seem maybe simpler than, than Paul's bold testimony. But, you know, if you put yourself in that situation, sometimes you feel a little nervous to, oh, definitely. you know, to, to speak boldly to people about things that you know are correct and you know will bless them if they, if they uh, follow up on it. Um, Paul and Joseph Smith and Alma the Younger all boldly testified and they weren't always well received. It doesn't because you boldly testify doesn't mean that people are going to be converted. But that's not 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 the reason we do it. In fact, there's a kind of a, a nice statement that Elder Neil Anderson um, said um, in a past conference. Let's see. He said we should care more about being his followers than being liked by our followers. It's not, it's not a popularity thing. We're not doing this to, to be received in, in that way um, or to, be, to convert people necessarily. So um, I remember when... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say I wanted to, to talk about that question that yeah. you asked. Yeah, okay, good. Because I did feel that when you were talking about, number one, how when we boldly say something, how oftentimes we too will have those negative responses. Mm -hmm. One thing that I noticed with social media is, you know, it's a double-edged sword in that on the one side, when we're talking about general authorities or even just members of the church who bear testimony, that oftentimes we will get negative yeah. responses. And the fact that oftentimes you can do those kinds of negative responses without actually doing it face-to-face, -face, mm -hmm. I think also means that a lot of times people do it more Mm -hmm. than they would have done if, if I had to actually scream in your face. Mm -hmm. You know, instead I scream on my social media. Mm -hmm. But along with that, it gives us the opportunity to boldly bear testimony to the world through social media that we do know this is true. Yeah. And social media missionaries, it does yeah. work and it is a thing. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. Well, and I was interested that when Paul stood before everyone, it had been six or seven years since this had happened, mm -hmm. but he told of his vision, of his conversion, mm -hmm. and that's what he testifies of both at Jerusalem and later yes. at Caesarea. And so I do think that so often we don't share those moments of conversion, those moments where we've seen, mm -hmm. where we've had miracles happen in our lives. And I think those need to be shared more often because that's what really wakes people up. That's what makes them know. And I think even if that conversion was that you were listening to the prophet and you felt your heart burn within you, mm -hmm. that he truly was the prophet, or if it was more than that, those moments that we have, and I think it's key that we have them often. I always feel like fasted testimony meeting is supposed to be a gleaning of the miracles that are happening in our congregation. Mm -hmm. And you pray that people stand up and share those moments like the road to Damascus that happen, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. maybe not that often in our lives because usually <laughs> when we have them, it's to correct. They can be That's smaller right. things, right? <laughs> they can, they can, they can, can be smaller, smaller things, things and be as impactful on us. I That's mean, they can, true. they can make a big difference in our lives. And I, again, think they, we need to preach them or teach them to our families. They need to feel the yes. impact of those things. Um, we had um, uh, several years ago, our daughter was biking and she was doing all the right things. She was in her bike lane, had her helmet on, but uh, a man slumped over the wheel of his car and crossed oh. over four lanes of traffic and hit her head on. Oh. Young mother with four young children. 
uh, broke all these bones and everything. But um, there were there were some definite miracles in that. The day before that, it was kind of when the temples were just opening back up after COVID, and you could go in as a family group. Mm-hmm. Our grandson was receiving his endowments, and as a family, we were in the temple together Mm -hmm. and in the prayer circle together and in the celestial room together. And I have the undeniable um, witness that we had angelic family Mm -hmm. angels there with us in that temple. It was the very next morning that Mm -hmm. our daughter was hit, and I went to the scene of the accident, and if I hadn't known that she was alive and in the hospital, I would have felt that for sure this person had been just demolished because it was so horrific. And at that moment, I again had that undeniable witness that those same ang- angelic family members were protecting her. So that year, our family... Our, our family uh, trip together, we concentrated on angels and miracles. And I thought, our children need to grow up with the knowing that what we know about miracles and about angels protecting us in our family. And, and uh, so I think those are the kind, it's, it's okay that I felt that, but it's not okay for me not to make sure that they all know what I know. And for my birthday this year, I asked each of them if they would, each of my family members, oh, if they would oh, share oh, a wonderful. faith, a, one of their faith experiences. And I said to the little ones, I said, even if it's just like I prayed because I lost my bracelet and Heavenly Father helped me find it. You know, it can be a simple, but the, some, so some of them are simple and some of them are just profoundly inspiring and they put it together in a little book with me with their each of their pictures and their little but this is the kind of thing that I think needs to be a legacy in families that we need to develop yeah to develop that kind of um, faith and the kind of willingness to boldly testify that's that's one of the examples that I get from this I Paul is just a tremendous example to me Uh, I am so grateful for his willingness to share. I love that. Yeah. You know, we were recently on a sister's retreat, we and were. it was fast and testimony meeting. Mm-hmm. And this little boy stood up. It was so sweet. It was and he said testimony. how he lost his his AirPods, or uh, what are they called, AirPods? Yeah, Air- mm-hmm. oh. And so he was so upset about it, and it was, like, really devastating. And he prayed, mm-hmm. and he found some, like, old, old ones, ones that had a <laughs> wire. But he felt like the Lord had answered his prayer. <laughs> and he was crying, this this cool little boy, and he was so embarrassed, but he was so touched by the Spirit. Yeah. And for him, it was such a miracle. Well, and I actually believe that Heavenly Father does answer some of those simple little prayers for, for the very mm-hmm. fact that he wants those children to have that as part of their their that. faith story. It was it just so too. touching. It was very, <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was. I but I do it kind of made all of us miracles. shed a little tear, I know, too. And, that and it is was just the kind about of thing air, that we need AirPods. to share, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and especially in our families. Yes. It's so yeah. beautiful. So, well, along with the fact that we're talking about sharing our testimonies, even in the midst of being thrown into prison, and Paul wasn't just being thrown into prison, we're talking physically accosted. I yes. mean, they are hitting him. They are slapping him around. I mean, th- he his life is in jeopardy, and it's not like, a, you know, far, far away on social media. Instead, they're in his face, literally physically hurting him and challenging him. But I, I love this part. If we go to Acts 23, and I'm just reading um, 10 through 11, and this is at the very beginning when he, he is there in front of the, the people where they're, you know, they are mad, they are angry. Ananias is having him, you know, slapped around. And and he says, and when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them. (laughs) I mean, we're not talking a little bit here. Commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. And this is the part that I just love. And the Lord and the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. And my guess at this time, 
he's probably thinking, I'm going to die. You know, I'm, I'm going to die. As a matter of fact, we know right after this that there's a group of men who bind themselves together in a secret combination and say, we're going to make sure that Paul is dead and we're not going to eat anything until we kill him. And, and so this is such a, a, I love this, be of good cheer. Now, along with that, if we compare that to what happens at the end of our reading, if we go to Acts 27, we have another incident where Paul is also in a perilous voyage going out in this ship, and he had warned them in the spirit of prophecy not <laughs> to go, listen. and nobody would listen. Oh. And so they are three days in this huge tempest, and it's so bad that neither sun nor stars in all that days appeared. I mean, it's that bad of a storm. And I mean, like this winter. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, kind of. Well, and then Paul, after a long abstinence, he stands up in the midst of them, and I love this. He says, sirs, you should have hearkened unto me <laughs> and not have lose from Crete and to have gained this oh, harm and loss. Isn't that funny? And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. Yeah. And when you think about that, wow, for him to say that when they've gone through this harrowing experience, so. for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. So the ship's not going to make it, but all the people are going to be okay. <laughs> You're good. For, and, and then he goes on and he said, And there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God and that it shall be even as it was told me. And the very last verse of this chapter says, they escaped all safe to land. Mm -hmm. All of them escaped safe to land. The other thought that came into my mind, too, was that of the early saints and how they, too, had these horrific experiences, like you were saying, Joseph Smith, and how he even talks about how similar to Paul he felt yeah. before King Agrippa. But this beautiful verse, it's Doctrine and Covenants 68, verses 5 and 6, I just love because it just, it, this is the promise that we have when we boldly stand and bear our testimony. The Lord said, Behold, this is the promise of the Lord unto you, O ye my servants. Wherefore, be of good cheer, and do not fear, for I, the Lord, am with you and will stand by you, and ye shall bear record of me, even Jesus Christ, that I am the Son of the living God, that I was, that I am, and that I am to come. Mm -hmm. So that is the promise when we stand boldly, that we can be of good cheer, mm -hmm. that we can know that the Lord's on our side, mm -hmm. and that he will make sure what is going to happen should happen. It's interesting that that be of good cheer phrase, I kind of looked them all up one day. <laughs> Just the, where do these come? They all come in these harrowing moments. Terrible times, yeah. I know. I, I, that's, a, that's instructive to me. <laughs> that's so. true. Well, and Christine, I know you were going to talk about safety and peace, which kind of goes along with this be of good cheer it does. that we were just talking it about. Does. And it is interesting how um, Paul is like protected at the worst time. So just like in Jerusalem when he's being pulled apart. Yeah. And then the um the chief captain comes forward of the Romans and saves him, pulls him up and allows him to be able to prophesy as we spoke. And sometimes it's the most unlikely people that save him. Oh, that's him. interesting that you know, it so is so well. oftentimes it's a centurion or somebody else that right. you would think Okay, he's saving Paul. He's yeah. not hurting Paul. That's true. Well, then as he goes to Caesarea, he again is given this opportunity to bear his testimony. And when I went on my personal mission, in my brain, I thought, if I really bore testimony correctly, that if everybody knew the church was true, that they would join the church. <laughs> and it was shocking to me how many people knew what I said was true and chose not to do it. Mm -hmm. and I was shocked by that. Have you had that similar experience where you've seen people? Oh, yes. Yeah. Definitely. Really? Oh, yes. On, on our 
on our mission, I'm sure Susan saw the same thing, where people would say, I know what the missionaries are telling me is true. But, but there's a fear of either other men or a loss of job, or I don't know what, but there are things that just, they just can't overcome that to follow what they know in their heart and mind. Or the traditions. Yeah. Right. And they're That's also right. dealing with traditions here, too, yeah. that people, whether it's the Jewish traditions or the Romans traditions, mm -hmm. they're right. also dealing with that well, as well. Well, I wanted to cover three people that listened to Paul that each in some way knew it was true mm -hmm. and made alternate choices. And I thought that was interesting when he was in Caesarea. So when he first gets to Caesarea, he meets Felix. And Felix is not a very scrupulous guy. <laughs> he um, actually talks to Paul. He listens and um, and Paul says he's a Roman citizen, but um, Felix it, and and in twenty four Acts twenty four twenty five. Um, so it says that. Um, sorry, I'm going to start at twenty four twenty four. So first of all, he brings in all the people. They all listen. There's a great tumult, but he realizes that Paul um, is not is is a Roman citizen. And that he's not bound by these laws that right. Ananias is saying. So he um, comes to him after many days. And it says, after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and he heard him concerning faith. And it says, and he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. And Felix trembled. So Felix really he was felt affected. It. He felt mm -hmm. it. He knew it was true. So then you're thinking, okay, so Felix, what are you going to do? And what does Felix mm -hmm. do? He binds him for two more years waiting for a bribe. Right. He wants the money. <laughs> he just he wants, wants the, the money. money. He knows so, that Paul's wealthy. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, he knows that he has money. And so he thinks that if I just keep him, he waits for that bribe. And if you look, he, he keeps him for two years mm -hmm. um, waiting for the bribe. And, um, and he left Paul bound. So it's in 27. But it's interesting to me that um, Satan himself knows that Jesus is the Christ, mm -hmm. but it doesn't affect his behavior. And there's this separation from what is true and how they behave without any guilt, which is Felix. And so that can sometimes be our response. We can tell the truth and there can be no reaction. But when um, Felix is replaced by Festus, Festus first comes to Jerusalem. And Festus seems like a very fair man because when he comes to Jerusalem, he's immediately brought up by Ananias. And you think those people that said they weren't going to eat until Paul was killed are probably pretty hungry because it's two years. Although right? <laughs> in the, there in would the, be really skinny. I know. But <laughs> in the Talmud, did you see what it said about making a vow about not eating? That if you make a vow about not, in Talmud, it talks specifically about a vow of not eating. And it says, if you make a vow of not eating and you break it, then you're obeying the laws of life. So it's okay to break it. It's oh, one of the few vows. Okay, like, so, oh. so it's kind of an empty vow. Right. So it was assumed okay, because so it's they, they probably mm -hmm. went and had a mm -hmm. feast they afterwards <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah, even though they didn't. But, um, but so Festus says, I first want to see if there's any wickedness in the man in 25.4. And so he goes up and he has the, um, he allows Ananias and all the people to come talk. And as he listens, he says that I found nothing mm -hmm. worthy of death in this man. That he doesn't see mm -hmm. any reason. So, um, but when Agrippa and Bernice come, he, um, they come with great pomp and circumstance to listen. And then Paul gives his story mm -hmm. of his mm -hmm. conversion. And as he does, the cutest thing, and you guys must have read this, Festus in 2624, it says, and Festus says with a loud voice, and I have had this reaction to people <laughs> listening to my testimony, Paul, thou art beside themselves, much learning doth make thee mad. <laughs> and so <laughs> he does think he knows a lot about the scriptures, but that he's lost his mind. mind. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny how some people can be very impressed by how much you know, but they just think that you're wrong. Crazy. That you're a little bit crazy. Mm -hmm. That you're a little bit off kilter. And so I thought that was interesting. I'm sure you guys have met people like that. And usually they're fair-minded, good people. Mm -hmm. They just think that you're deceived. 
Right. And so um, just a little crazy. Yeah. And so um, that's the reaction. And then the third reaction is the one that is just so beautiful where um, Agrippa listens. And again, he's just a young 20-year-old man. And um, as he listens, he said, almost thou persuadeth me to be a Christian. And he had come back from Rome and asked specifically to, he was going to stay in Rome, but he asked specifically to come back to help save his people mm -hmm. because he knew they were on thin ice with the Roman government right. and he was close friends with the emperor. And so at this point, his intent is different. His intent isn't to follow this Christian sect, but to try and save the Jewish mm -hmm. people. And I think that key of real intent is, is the key. So my question is, when you see these reactions of people that each felt the spirit, they each listened to Paul, and were changed, but they made alternate choices. Do you think there was still value and strength in Paul preaching to them? 100% yes. I just want to go to what Paul said, though. Oh, go ahead. For what Paul answered Agrippa when he said that. Oh, I love it. He said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and all together, mm -hmm. such as I am, except these bonds. And I like that, except these bonds. Yes. I don't yes. want them to have to go through what I'm going right. through because of my testimony. To know. But I want them to know. I and I and everyone I to know. I want love to give that. I want the them all together, such as I am. I, know. And I want them to totally converted. have that strong testimony. Yeah, my heart goes out to people who don't have the courage when they feel it to somehow be able to make that change. And yet, um, I, you know, there again, you ask yourself, would, would I have courage in such situations or do I have courage when I'm in harrowing situations to stand boldly? So, so it's, you know, we can feel for them That's and true. yet we need to look inward as well. That is such an interesting idea of looking inward because mm -hmm. sometimes we think because we've accepted the gospel, mm -hmm. but there's things that we may not have accepted mm -hmm. that, you know, that we're hedging on. So mm -hmm. that is fascinating to look inward. Um, but I do think the key is that our calling is to preach the gospel to all people mm -hmm. and whether they listen or not is up to them. And so his garments were washed clean mm -hmm. of their guilt because he did share the gospel. And I think how many people have we rubbed shoulders with and not shared or lifted or, or done that? And I, um, in DNC 29 7, there's this great scripture that says, You're called to bring to pass the gathering of mine elect, for mine elect hear my voice and harden not their hearts. Mm -hmm. And I just um, was so touched as I thought, have you ever rubbed shoulders with the elect mm -hmm. when okay. you, um, sorry, share your testimony and they get it and mm -hmm. it changes them? And it's just like a jewel. And there aren't many of them, but they're there. Yes. They are. And it's, the key is that we go through and share openly and we will find those elect yes. and those moments. And I just wanted to end with... Um, Talk about the elect, that cute um, story that President Nelson told about sharing the Book of Mormon with two people that were colleagues of his. Mm -hmm. There was a doctor and a nurse that were married. Do you remember the story? Mm -hmm. it's such it's a good one. story. And he gave them the Book of Mormon, and they um, he asked them to read it. And they went a couple of weeks, and they brought back the book and said, thank you. And he said, that is not an appropriate the answer, answer. <laughs> for I someone who's it. read the Book of Mormon. Because the truth is, they'll either be like these people, mm -hmm. or they're going to accept it. And so he said, did you really read it? And they said, no. And they went back and read it, and they were the elect. Mm -hmm. And so like Paul, we have to have that strength to say, did you really read it? Did you mm -hmm. really believe and I just think that sometimes we um, need to learn from Paul to share. Well, and along with that, Paul, because he was willing to do that, did have a conscious conscience void of offense. And I know, Susan, you were going to well, talk yeah, about that. Well, yeah, I mean, he was, uh, he was always willing to bear this testimony. He was always willing to be true to that co conversion that we've talked about. Um, you know, we used to say to our missionaries, your mission will be a success if you bear your testimony every day. And it doesn't matter what the numbers are that, you know, who accepts what you're saying, but your 
conversion will be, I mean, your, te- your mission will be successful if you bear your testimony. And of course, that's what Paul was doing. I think that um, this being able to have a conscience um, void of offense toward God and men is pretty miraculous, actually. And I think that it, it goes back to the miracle of forgiveness, I, Paul in that conversion was forgiven and taught, but then that that is a miracle, and, and it cleanses us. That that uh, forgiveness cleanses us so thoroughly that we we have to be true to it. I mean, if you think about the Ammonites in the Book of Mormon, and they buried those swords, and they they had consciences void of offense because they never. That, 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 that being forgiven was so powerful to them that they never wanted to offend God or man, no matter their lives or whatever. And I think that, that's, I think that Paul is in that situation and that we need to be. Um, I, I, I was listening, in, when I was listening in conference, I thought there were several um, um, talks where the, the brethren were willing to be kind of vulnerable and tell of some of their own um, times when they didn't make good choices. Um, one that struck me was when President Ballard told about not following the Holy Ghost and blessing the widow in his ward who then passed away during the night and how sorrowful he was. And I'm sure he sought forgiveness of that. And he is a, was a personal friend to my parents and he um, kind of moved heaven and earth to give them both blessings at the end of their days. Oh, and I thought when he, when he told that story, I thought, you haven't told the rest of the story. The rest of the story is that you're, you can have a free conscience because you never went back once you were repented of that wrongdoing and, and f- were forgiven. It was strong for you, and you kept your, you were conscience free. Your conscience was free from, from that, that, uh, not, you know, that sin that you, that you committed. Anyway, so I, I think that there are modern day examples. And I think that we, when we have been forgiven, that's, that's one of our quests to make that so compelling in our lives that we can be, uh, have uh, have no offense towards God or or man. I agree with you. I think, though, in today's world, that one of the challenges is people that have had a struggle during their youth or teenage years or maybe during college will carry that weight around and don't really believe in Christ or well, believe in the atonement. Or other people won't let them leave it. You know oh, what I'm saying? And, Which and, is and, also and a hard time. And then that's fault of us. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. And that we need to make sure that people have the opportunity yes. to, to be to, to, to their be That's right. right? To that's change. right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of the last point that we wanted to make today is the healing power of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's interesting, if we turn to the very last chapter that we're reading here in chapter 28, we have some pretty miraculous experiences of healing. The first one has to do with a a snake bite. And for me, I hate snakes. I mean, I really do. And I just read this story and cringed inside, just thought, oh, now, if that happened to me, I would probably die of fright, not because of the viper. But um, so he's grabbing some sticks, throwing them on the fire, and the, the snake bites him on the hand. And everybody that's watching it just know he, he's dead. And then nothing happens. And because nothing happens, the people say, well, he must be a god because this doesn't make sense. And then right after that, the chief man, we talked about Publius before, his father and a bloody f- flux and being having a fever, this doesn't look good for the father. My guess is the father's on his deathbed. And yet Paul prays over him lays his hands on him, obviously gives him a priesthood blessing, and heals him. Mm -hmm. And then after that, everybody there on Malta brings their people that need to be healed, and he heals all of them. And so we have this wonderful experience of healing, 
and it's through the Savior, Jesus Christ. And the thing that just struck me here is that, yes, we have these experiences of of healing, of miraculous physical healing, but also at the end, when he gets to Rome, as you talked about the last two verses of what we read this week, this week, when he says, and Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him. It didn't matter whether it was Jew, Gentile, you know, Roman, rich, poor, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And I just thought right there, that is the healing power of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And I just wanted to ask you, um, before I share one last thought from President Hinckley, um, how has the Lord healed your families? I know, Susan, you've had some miraculous healings, not just your daughter, but your husband as well, that have recently happened in your families. And I know, too, Christine, you have experienced amazing healings in your family, too. I just wanted to hear some of your thoughts on this. Well, you know, um, sometimes in the moment with our daughter, Marianne, um, it was in the moment that I I felt the miracles. With my husband, it wasn't in the moment, but just then sometimes looking back, um, I had a friend come over and say, describe to me what you know, what happened, and then what happened, and then what happened. And every time, as I was telling her the story, with each successive incident, I'd say, and then a real miracle happened, you know, and then it was such a miracle the way this worked. And then it couldn't have happened except by a miracle. I mean, that was, and that I could, in hindsight, I could just see the Lord's hand in just so many little instances. And, um, and, I, I'm grateful for hindsight. I think during the the process of it, right, in, as we were going through it, I think I was a little bit numb, mm-hmm. and I I think that that's that kind of sometimes happens too. But thank goodness uh, for hindsight and being able to recognize all of those things that happened as blessings. Um, and then, of course, he had several uh, wonderful priesthood blessings that made promises that we were able to put our faith in, even in the times when it didn't seem like those might be fulfilled, but we could exert our faith in those priesthood blessings. And we really have just had a a marvelous season of miracles. And Christine, I know in your family too, you have seen miracles. We have. And what touches me about Paul is that because of the viper bite, Then he was able to heal Mm -hmm. um, Pluvius, and then he went from there to healing all these people. Mm -hmm. And then those that were with him, we can assume were probably like, that's why he was able to hire his house. That's why people were able to come to them, because they could witness of the things they had seen. And um, I have struggled with with things in my life and with health, and I had a son who um, was fainting because he had heart issues, and they mm-hmm. were going to do a, 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 what is it called, a, a surgery on him. And as they were doing that last surgery, getting ready to do it, a doctor walked by the door and caught my eye and walked in and said, what are you doing? And he looked at the x-ray and said, scar is surrounding his heart, which is why he's having this issue, and if you did the surgery you're planning, it would kill him immediately. Mm-hmm. And if I hadn't been looking out the window because I was frustrated with the doctors not listening to me and caught that man's eye, and he was the owner of the hospital, Mm -hmm. it was Dr. Gunderson, it was the Luther Gunderson Hospital, then my oldest son would not have survived. And and it's like those steps, but... It's a miracle. My children know that story and Mm -hmm. felt like an angel was watching over him. And because they know that story... My children, it is one of those anchors of faith that it kept them very, very connected. And so it's interesting because through different trials and different experiences, they found their testimony through those struggles. And just as it happened with Paul, so sometimes the struggles become anchors Mm -hmm. that pull us closer to the Lord. And obviously that happened in Paul's life. Yes. I did want to leave with this thought by President Hinckley. He said, I would that the healing power of Christ 
might spread over the earth and be diffused through our society and into our homes, that it might cure men's hearts of the evil and adverse elements of greed and hate and conflict. I believe it could happen. I believe it must happen. If the lamb is to lie down with the lion, then peace must overcome conflict. Healing must mend injury. What a way to end in terms of this idea. We live in a world right now that needs the healing power of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So thank you so much for your testimonies today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching Women Read Scripture. We hope to hear from you. Please write your comments below. Also, subscribe to our channel. We hope to see you again.